This episode of Live WP TV is sponsored by the Microsoft Nerd Center in Cambridge and HostGator.com. Thank you guys for showing up. Uh, we are the Boston WordPress Meetup. The Wi-Fi code, if you haven't already logged in, it's under the Cambridge network, BW0930 as the password. You can find us at bostonwp.org, at bostonwp on Twitter, hashtag bostonwp, because we're cool like that. I'm Kurt, by the way. I'm Calum. Uh, big thanks to Microsoft. Um, we've been here for about, well over four years now. Um, they've been providing an outstanding venue, AV, Wi-Fi support, and we'll be here next month hosting our WordCamp Boston event. So just a quick shout out to some of the sponsors and supporters of our group, um, HostGator um, is a robust shared hosting provider that has a lot of um, tools available to run a good WordPress install on it, one-click install, um, excellent shared host for running a number of different WordPress sites on the same account. Um, and they do provide us with a Boston WP meetup code for a 25% discount um, as part of their support for our group. So if you're looking for a shared host, consider HostGator. And if you're looking for a more WordPress uh, hosted account, WP Engine, uh, they are also one of our major sponsors. Um, they focus specifically on WordPress hosting. Um, you can use the code WP Meetup Boston 2013 for one month free off their personal hosting plan. So our website, bostonwp.org, uh, we have our meeting minutes, info, videos, job boards, uh, forums, um, and we always say soon for GitHub. We do have a GitHub account if you're a developer. Um, we're interested in having the Boston WP GitHub account be a place where people can go to get information about Boston area or centralized um, WordPress development projects. So if you're interested in working with us to publicize any of your work through that channel, feel free to get in touch with one of us, one of us after the meeting. Uh, so I'm Kurt, as I mentioned. Uh, our, my email's here. We're short on little organizers tonight. Cadam's here. Kelly's here. Tom and Tom's in here in the back. Uh, Mel and Eric are off somewhere, and John's doing work. And Rick goes home. Social media, we're on Facebook, uh, Twitter. We're also on YouTube. For If you want to see some of, uh, some of our past 200 plus videos, there are, just search for Boston WP. And we're also on Google Plus, because everyone else should be. Um, we're here through November. There is no meetup next month. Um, that's because of WordCamp Boston. But we do have a meetup set. We have a date set, and I'll put that up on uh, meetup.com for November. We also will not be having a December meetup. It's usually because it coincides with the holidays. Uh, so we might throw a small get together at some local pub and just chat. So. Who has been to a WordCamp in the past? Awesome, about half the room. WordCamp is a series of conferences that are run around the world, um, organized around WordPress from a blogging standpoint, from a development standpoint, and everything in between. This is going to be, um, we've run since 2010, is that correct? Yeah. Uh, we've had Word, WordCamp Boston, which is an event that has been run annually Originally here at NERD, then over across the river at Boston University for a while, we were actually pleased to be returning to this space, to NERD, for the conference that we're throwing in one month's time at the end of October. Um, it is going to be the weekend of the 25th, 26th, and 27th. We're having a couple of workshops on Friday the 25th, and then a two-day multi-track conference with speakers and presentations on topics of all sorts related to web development design and blogging on Saturday and Sunday. The times for that, I know there were some questions on the meetup um, thread for this event. It is going to be from 12 to 6 on Friday, and on Saturday and Sunday, we're going to have talks um, on Saturday from 9 to 6, probably starting a little bit later on Sunday, but again, going until 5.30 or 6. So the fact that all of you are here at Pfizer are local, travel plans probably aren't as big an issue for you. But if anyone you know is considering uh, attending WordCamp and is looking for some of the more specific times, we are going to be trying to put up a more kind of comprehensive schedule in the next few days. 
So I know speakers haven't quite been released. Um, we had mentioned in the previous slide. It is gonna be a little bit smaller this year. We only have room for about 400 because Microsoft is so small. Um, so I think we've already gone through like, you know, 100, almost 100 tickets already. Um, and so buy your tickets now if you're planning to. <laughs> yes. And if you uh, uh, sign up to volunteer, on the other hand, we will be getting in touch with you within the next 48 hours with more information about that. Yes. And since you guys are here, we're gonna break some, some news about some speakers and some topics. That's kind of hard to read. It's a little hard to read. <laughs> but you can see that there's a bunch of them, which is a plus. And there's um, a num we're going to have uh, Mo Jangda talking about caching for your website, performance enhancements. Uh, John James Jacoby, or JTrip, talking about BB Press, which is the blog um, forums tool built on top of WordPress. Andrew Nason, one of the lead developers of WordPress, is going to be giving a presentation, uh, presumably about sort of the future and the roadmap of the WordPress project. Mika Epstein, who is one of the lead support um, wizards, for lack of a better term, on WordPress and works for DreamHost, is going to be talking about managed hosting, essentially looking at the question of HostGator versus WP Engine, that type of divide, which type of host is right for you. We're going to please have John Block talking about some more developer-centric stuff, um, particularly command line tools and how, as a software developer working on the internet, you can use them. Dan Beal is going to be talking about custom host types how to structure your data a little bit more robustly within WordPress. We're going to have a talk on sort of the essence of design and where you should probably stop making things pretty and start designing by Michelle Schlup. Schlup. Um, Chris Ferdinandi is going to be talking about, again, fast WordPress, high performance. Christina Ng is, that you say that? is talking about optimizing your WordPress with analyst, uh, analytics. Um, using Google Analytics and other analytics tools to improve your blog's performance and your conversions. Lisa Wood's talking about web design best practices for non-designers. If you're sort of wondering what this whole design thing is about, there's going to be some more intro-level talks on that subject. We're also going to have Louise Leduc Kennedy talking about some of the legal changes that have happened in Massachusetts. I know there's been some back and forth around um, taxation rules as uh, online developers over the past few months, he's going to give me an update on where that stands and the other legal implications for developers and designers. John Moss is going to be talking about using WordPress to drive a network of public school websites. So if you're in the education sector or if you know people who are, WordPress being a free tool is a very useful platform to build a site for a school upon. He's going to get some more information there. Uh, Jake Goldman. The director of 10UP is going to be talking about interview questions for developers that he asks to be able to identify potential talent. Stephen Word of our local meetup group is going to be talking about using WordPress for things beyond the blog. And finally, um, we're going to have uh, another series of workshops for um, attendees of all skill levels that we will be announcing shortly. And I was going to say something, but I totally forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> but, oh, 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 I got it now. I got it now. So you can see, I mean, we, we've tried to cover a large gamut of, of topics, uh, beginners, developers, designers. Um, we have some marketing, marketing SEO. Or, yep. So this is just a small sample of what's been accepted so far. Um, we definitely have a lot more that we didn't fit into this one tiny little slide. Um, but this is just the highlight so far. So late breaking news. Um, do you guys have any questions about WordCamp before we move on? You can sign up by visiting boston.wordcamp.org. The URL is up there. The 2013 is actually optional, but we'll redirect to that no matter what. Yeah. Uh, pricing is going to be $20 per day, so for the full weekend, including workshops, it will be $60. For just Saturday and Sunday, it will be $40. Nope, Friday is just workshops. So again, we, there's going to be six workshops. Um, I know we have a beginner workshop, we have an intermediate workshop. I think we have a design workshop. We definitely will have a develop a dev. I think one or two dev workshops. Um, <laughs> it, it's all in the, the it's afternoon. all in the afternoon. It goes from noon to six. Yep. So just regarding the uh, tech tag, so we've all signed up the PLS. So it's yep. That's what we were saying, updates, where things stand now, and other issues other than that particular issue. Yeah. Yeah. 
Now, this, the session was proposed before that repeal had happened. Thankfully, yeah. it did. So uh, there will be sort of a broader spectrum of legal implications to developers instead of just focusing on that one issue. If you're not familiar, there was a crazy tax thing involving web development. Fortunately, it looks like it's going away. Yes. Look at the gas tax. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. All three days include lunch? <laughs> no. Friday, I believe, is not. Friday does not include lunch. But we do have snacks all three days. We're still working on food because it's food. Food's like one of those gray areas, especially you know trying to figure out dietary needs and everything like that. So. It's going to depend partially on the speaker and the presenter for the workshops. I think that the intermediate session may be geared a little bit more towards an end user and less towards a designer who's building their own sites. I'm not sure yep. whether that's true or not. But um, in terms of the individual sessions, there's going to be, uh, I presume, some intermediate level design sessions that will span the full range from, from where you are, lower and higher. Um, so it's going to be, I believe, partially a matter of looking at the content of the session and figuring out whether it was of interest to Yes. Yeah, eventually. Once, once we get confirmation from everybody else, yeah. we still need to put together a schedule when speakers are going to be talking. The sessions that are on the slide will go up over the next Yeah, the, this, this will go up, but I mean, we, we just don't have time slots and everything like that. But all of the information will be on the website if you continue checking back. Um, I believe we also have a newsletter for it that will do something. We do? There's a sign-up <laughs> form for it. I don't know where that goes. <laughs> Okay, 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 good. We can also buy tickets from you. Uh, you can, you can only buy, buy them online. online, but you could do it right now if you so choose. Yeah, we, we do, there, are, there are tangible tickets. Um, we, we will have a, you know, Excel spreadsheet. We'll, ha we'll have badges printed out for you. So everything will be taken care of. Um, but you all just the show registrations up. Yeah, you just show up and go to registration. Any other questions about WordCamp? For this year's that is the sticker. <laughs> oh, hey now. So uh, when I when I so you guys get the first glimpse of that too. Um, yeah, it was a little big when I when I got it, but it's nice. It's transparent. So yes. 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 Plugin development, theme development, design, marketing, SEO, analytics. We've tried to cover all the bases. No, it's it here. is where you are sitting, in fact. We, we are going to be having it um, in this space, both on this whole floor, um, all the way back, all the way forward, and also we're going to, on Saturday and Sunday, have speakers on the 11th floor as well. No. One ticket, free to wander as you choose after that. You don't have to attend the sessions if you don't want to. <laughs> there are there there actually are room uh, size limitations to the rooms, um, so we will have volunteers actively looking at that. Is it single track? No, it's multiple three track. track. Three tracks. So. Yep. And we will be having um, sessions videotaped. So in the event that a room does fill up, we're going to do our best to make sure that they are recorded so that people can watch the content later on. Yes. Moving on. Yep. All right, uh, other WordPress meetups. Quick shout out to our neighbors. Up in Manchester, New Hampshire, there is the WordPress Dev and Users Meetup run by Jonathan May, who attends here frequently. I don't see him tonight, but um, he's a good group of folks. Have an interesting meetup up north if that's the direction in which you live. Down in the south, there's also the Providence, Rhode Island WordPress Meetup by another Boston WP friend, Jesse Friedman, um, one of the organizers of WordCamp Providence, which happened last month. Mm -hmm. And um, there's also the Seacoast, Yes, WordPress Portsmouth, meetup in New Portsmouth, Hampshire. New Hampshire, which we should probably put on. I will add that for the next meetup. Promise. You can get links to all of those on our website, which is bostonwp.org as well. Down in the footer, there's links to our neighbors. Um, well, the WordPress events is an SEO workshop on October 19th in Weymouth from 1 to 4. If you want some more information, talk to Tom in the back. Uh, any questions? How about anyone hiring? 
Okay. We do generally try to take a moment at the beginning of the meetup, beginning of the meetups, to give anyone who is hiring or is looking for developers to, or, or potentially is a developer and is looking for work, a chance to present and um, take a couple minutes to announce anything that they might have to talk about. So. Um, so my name is Chelsea, and I work with an organization called Hands On Tech Boston. We are in our second year here, um, loving it. What we do is we provide IT support for nonprofits, specifically those who focus on poverty alleviation. We do this in two different ways. We provide um, free trainings. We do some of them here at the Nerd Center. We partner with Google. Google is actually a sponsor of ours. And then, um, so we do things on like you know Salesforce, WordPress. Um, all the Microsoft Office tools. Um, the second thing that we do is we do um, sort of consulting projects for nonprofits. Um, they can apply, and we will review the application, see what they need, um, and hopefully pair them with someone who we call a skills-based volunteer, basically someone who is an expert in the field. So we get a lot of applications for WordPress, actually. And so this is a call for WordPress volunteers. Um, an opportunity to help out a nonprofit in the area who really needs to develop a new website. They're not as familiar with the platforms. Um, a lot of them have no clue how to even start a WordPress website. Um, so we'd really appreciate your help. And if you're interested, please see me after the meeting, and I will be you signed up. Thank you very much. Anybody else? Going once? Or twice? All right, we only have one talk tonight, so we're going to spend the next hour focused on Dave. Optimize image files like a pro. All right. Wow. Just making sure that's on. Uh, thank you all so much for coming out tonight. Um, I, I know you go out to see like a, a stand-up comedian you know, someone like that, or, or even a small theater group, and they come out on stage and they're like, thank you, thank you. No, but, but really, thank you so much for coming out. Uh, I don't know how many of you are aware, but down the road over at Boku, they, they're doing a Q&A session with the W3C Technical Architecture Group, the group who's defining the, the web technologies that are going to bring us into the 21st century, a group chaired by Tim Berners-Lee, the guy who invented the World Wide Web, and you guys are here. <laughs> and I love it. Thank you so much. I wasn't sure how many people were going to be here tonight. This is great, and, and it feels good, not just for me. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's full. Yeah. <laughs> and, and we have better pizza. Trust me. That's true. <laughs> But no, thank you for coming out. It first of all it makes me feel great, and it's also a good reflection on WordPress. It shows the kind of strong community we have, and, and really the, the community is the backbone of, of WordPress itself. So I, I know I'm trying to be all, all cute here, but, but thank you so much for, for coming out. This means a lot. Um, I'm Dave Ross. I am one of the senior web engineers at 10 Up. I am a WordPress plugin developer, a WordPress core contributor, and uh, some of you might have seen me give this exact presentation down at WordCamp Providence uh, a couple months ago. And uh, I also did a presentation at uh, WordCamp Boston last year. Um, I was microdata for SEO. I don't know if any of you were, were there for that session. But uh, interesting thing about that is uh, I had been in Boston exactly a week when that happened. Um, my wife got a job out here. Uh, she moved out here a couple months before I did, and uh, we ended up selling the house faster than, a, than I had planned on. Uh, my plan was I was going to submit a talk, right? Submit a talk at Word, WordCamp Boston, right? And then I'd have an excuse to fly out here and see her. And while well, we sold the house, and I ended up moving here, uh, that was my first time on the T. That was really interesting. <coughs> but uh, no, no, it was a lot of fun. I had a great time. Um, moving out here was very, very interesting. Uh, I came here from Chicago. I grew up in a town called Wheeling, and then later in a town called Mount Prospect. Had a house in Lombard. And then uh, I had to navigate a thousand miles to get to Boston. And that was a really interesting trip. Um, really nice scenery, 
you know, going through New York, Pennsylvania, beautiful scenery. Only problem was these guys. We came to Boston with three cats in the car. That's uh, Turing on the left, that's Daisy on the right, and I don't know if you can see here, there's a terrier with uh, Margarita. And that was a thousand miles, three days of meow, meow, <laughs> meow. So uh, really, really interesting. And um, these guys were great. I mean, they, they survived the trip. They, they made it just fine. Um, Anyway, as, as we started to get used to Boston, you know, we started exploring further and further out. A couple months ago, we went out to the Boston Harbor Islands. I don't know if any of you have taken any of the tours, gone out to, uh, we went to George's Island. Uh, I don't know if you've been out there, but there's this, this fort that was built prior to the Civil War. Uh, it was dedicated in 1850. Uh, by the time the Civil War was around, it was obsolete. They, they said, we don't know what we're going to do with this. They've, they've got ships that can actually shoot over the walls. So they used it to house Confederate prisoners. They, they used it during World War II to, to keep the shoreline safe. Uh, they found uses for it, right? But this is a fort out in the middle of the ocean. Uh, it's a 20-minute boat ride from uh, Long Wharf out to George's Island. And uh, the funny thing about that is here I was 20 minutes out from the coast, and I had four bars on my phone. My wife and I were able to go down to the beach, again, out in the middle of the ocean, and, and book a dinner reservation from, from the beach in the middle of the ocean. And, and that, that just blew my mind. I don't know if they have sharks with cell towers on their backs, or? That's unusual. Who's your carrier? AT&T, which is really the weird part. <laughs> I hope nobody here works for AT&T. Um, <laughs> But no, that, that was incredible. And I don't know how many of you saw this a couple months ago. Google announced that they were going to put blimps over Africa to deliver wireless broadband to some of the most underserved parts of the planet, to, to bring mobile broadband into people's hands, to, to allow people to start businesses, to reach a worldwide audience with their websites, with their stores, bring their products to people, communicate with friends and loved ones miles away. It's just an amazing change to the world. It's also an amazing change for the, the wireless broadband carriers, right? Because they, they say, oh, this is a new deal. OK, well, we've got new terms. We're going to start charging you by the megabyte. You know, it used to be you'd, you'd get uh, broadband to your house, you know, your Comcast or your DSL. And they'd say, for 30 bucks a month, we're, we'll limit your speed, but not how much you can use within reason. Um, but now, now that we're all on cell phones and tablets, they're starting to say we're going to you know, set a meter here, and every, every megabyte you use you know, eats up your, your allotment for the month. And um, so that kind of becomes a problem for us as, as bloggers, as front-end developers, as back-end developers, people building, building websites, right? I took a look at a few popular websites. Uh, this is using uh, Chrome's Web Inspector tool here. Um, I'm actually having it show just the image information. So here, here's the total, here's the image, and, and so on. Here's eBay's homepage, a nice, clean, modern design, good typography, lots of images, because you know you, they want you to bid on these items, right? Or even better, buy them now. Um, the entire front page of eBay was 881 kilobytes. <laughs> The images alone from that web page were 691K. Um, that's quite a bit. That, that's maybe, what, three quarters of a megabyte or so? Um, you know, that, that's, that's a lot. Um, back on your Apple II, I mean, that's an entire floppy disk there, a three and a half inch floppy. Rub it in. <laughs> hey, the Commodore was much better. Doctor Who. Uh, we have any Doctor Who fans in the audience at all? No. Come on, I figured this group. <laughs> Maybe over at the, the Tim Berners-Lee thing. Okay, uh, Doctor Who, BBC's Doctor Who website. Beautiful images, right? We've got this beautiful space graphic here. We've got beautiful pictures of, of Peter Capaldi, the new doctor. He starts uh, sometime in 2014 and, and all that. The, the entire web page is 1.4 megabytes. Of that, 792K 
Over half of the data sent to render this web page is images. And this, this one really blew my mind, The Onion, uh, everyone's favorite satirical newspaper. The front page was 4.9 megabytes. Of that, 910K were images. Okay, that's almost an entire megabyte right there. That's a lot of data. And you got to realize that's being sent. Now, these are desktop websites, okay? If we were looking at these on a phone, they might send a stripped down version with fewer images or smaller image files. But just for, for comparison's sake, I mean, think about that. That's, that's an, almost an entire megabyte just for images. That needs to be downloaded over possibly an LTE connection, maybe 4G, 3G, some parts in the world. You know, even, even in rural America, they're lucky if they can get Edge or GPRS. So, so you got to imagine that's a lot of data being sent down a pipe that might not be the fastest internet connection out there. And in addition to that, it has to download all the JavaScript and CSS, all the other things that make up that five meg total there. And that, that not only affects the, the time it takes for those images to appear, it affects the, the entire time it takes that page to appear. And there's been studies done that show that, and I'm sure you know, your own ex experience can attest, if, if you have to spend two, three seconds waiting for a web page to show up, you're going to close that tab and go do something else. I mean, nobody has the patience for that. Um, in fact, um, Matt Cutts over at Google you know, made it very explicitly clear. He's, he's their search engine optimization guru. He's, he's kind of in charge of all that. He said, you know, speeding up your website isn't just something that can affect your search rankings. It's a fantastic idea for your users. They want a good user experience. They want people going to fast websites that load quickly and get them information. And they're actually going to take that into account when they're ranking what, uh, what search results appear on a page because it's that important. Back in uh, 1982 or 83, um, there was an engineer named Larry Kenyon. He was working on uh, the Macintosh over at uh, Apple. And um, he was working on the code that was used to boot the machine. And uh, he'd been working on it for months. I think he had it down to like a minute or 30 seconds. But uh, he's sitting there one day typing away. And Steve Jobs walks in the room. And he says, Larry. Because that's how Steve Jobs talked, right? And, and uh, he's like, Larry, I need you to shave 10 seconds off the boot time of, of this computer. And, and Larry's like, Steve, I've been working on this for months. I don't know what else I can do. He's like, Larry, I want you to think of it this way. Um, we're going to shave, we're going to, well, we're going to sell millions of these things. Let's say five million Macintoshes in the first year. I don't know how accurate that was. But let's say five million. And, and people are going to love these things. You guys have been working really hard on them. And, and people are going to love these. They're going to want to use them every day of their lives. You know, Monday through Friday for work, and then they're going to take them home on the weekends and play with them, play, play games. That's why they put the handle on top. Um, and, and so they're, they're going to be booted up at least seven times a week, times five million machines, times, times 365 days a year, times however many years they're going to hang on to these things. Larry, if you take 10 seconds off the boot time, and the average lifetime is how many seconds, you're going to be saving 12 or 13 lives by doing this. <laughs> and I know that sounds crazy, but when your boss comes to you and puts it in terms like that, especially Steve Jobs, you don't say no, right? And he did it. He found a way to take 10 seconds off the boot time. Now, why am I telling you this long, rambly story about Steve Jobs? Because I want you to think about AT&T's most inexpensive data plan. Notice I didn't say cheapest. This isn't, uh, this isn't the cheapest by megabyte. This is the cheapest per month. Some people, this is all they can afford. Some people, it's all they want to afford. You know, some people just want to check email and maybe surf the web a little, and that's fine. They don't need a 2 gigabyte or 4 gigabyte or 10 gigabyte plan. Um, but really, when you think about it, they're paying 7 cents to download a megabyte of data. And if you look at a page like that Onion homepage, 910 kilobytes for images, it costs 7 cents to download the images on that web page. That's real tangible money. 
Multiply that by the thousands or millions of people who might see that homepage in one day. You could pay off the national debt. You're not saving lives, but I mean, seriously, that, that seven cents is going to add up. So what can you do about it? Well, I'd like to talk about a couple, couple programs that are going to help you squeeze every bite you can out of the images on your website. Okay, some of these are desktop tools, which are good for game developers and plugin developers. Some of these are WordPress plugins that will help you as you're, as you're blogging, as you're posting content on your website. And one of them is really for the geeks. It's a command line tool, horrible user interface, but it's really, really cool. And I want to I wanna stress with all of this that the goal of this isn't smaller images. I know I'm telling you to, to save those seven cents for everybody, right? Okay, I'm not saying make all your images the size of a postage stamp because we've got beautiful cameras. I mean, we're all walking around with one of these in our pockets, and they they got, what, 10, 12 megapixel cameras in them? I mean, you can take beautiful pictures with these things. We all have them everywhere we go. So let's take beautiful pictures, let's put them on the web, and make the web a beautiful place. But let's make sure that the file sizes are small, that we're not costing people real money, that we're not causing slow page load time. And, and turning people off on, our, on the websites that we build. Because it, it's really important that we have this world-changing technology and that we use it to, to better ourselves and the world around us. So let's start by looking at a couple desktop tools. This is one of my favorites. It's Image Optim. Uh, as you can see from that icon, I love that icon. It, it's, it's squeezing that poor guy. It's, it's squeezing every bite out of that picture of that guy. And as you can see, Image Optim has a really simple user interface. Some of the detail gets lost on this projector, but there's this really faint gray arrow, and that's about it. <laughs> and it says here on the bottom, drag and drop image files into the area above. And I want to start with the picture of my kitties with Daisy and Turing there. That's, granted, this is a bigger image than you're going to be using in your theme or your plugin. This is a 3.1 megabyte image, 2,000 something by 3,000 something, the maximum resolution my wife's phone, camera phone could take. But, uh, you know, that's okay. We're going to get some nice dramatic results, and you can really see what this software is capable of. So if we take our kitties here, and we drag them into Image Optim, it's going to do some number crunching on them. You can see it's, it's got a gear there. Oh, it's finished. Okay, moving cats. Trimmed it down from 3.1 megabytes to about 2.6, 2.7. And it managed to shave 9.6% off the file size of that image, almost 10%. That's quite a huge improvement. And, as you can see, to the extent that this projector will let us see, there's no real discernible difference in the image quality, although they got rotated. That's just the camera phone thing. Some of you might be familiar with that. It tries to figure out which way you're holding the camera, and it doesn't always do that right. But still, we, we took 10% off, off the size of that image without affecting image quality. There, there's a whole bunch of things involved in a modern image file. You know, way back in the day, it was uh, we had just simple bitmap image files. It said this pixel's red, this pixel's green, this pixel's red. Right now, an image file is almost more like a database. And in that database, you've got things like copyright information. You've got the name of the camera that was used to take it, the f-stop setting, whether or not a flash was in use, the latitude and longitude you were standing at when you took that picture. Um, uh, the, the, what, uh, what ISO film standard your camera was emulating at the time. All that information, that's great, but it might not be necessary just to render that image. So one thing this, this program is doing is it's going into that file and it's taking, taking all that stuff out, leaving you with just an image and maybe a thumbnail in there. Um, another thing these, these programs do is, um, you know how when you go to save uh, an image in Photoshop, you get that slider, right? It tells you, do you want to 
What, what quality do you want? Do you want 100%, 90%? You never know where to put that, right? Because you know if you put it too far to the left, the image isn't going to look as good. If you put it too far to the right, the file is going to be huge. Well, what these programs are doing is they're using image processing algorithms. They're looking at the, the color resolution that the eye is able to, to discern. They're looking at you know, the angle that, that your eye is able to, to detect a pixel. And they're taking all that into account, and they're trying to figure out how far can I move that slider to the left without affecting the image quality. And they're doing that, as you can see, in 15 seconds, in 20 seconds, relatively in the blink of an eye. And uh, if you look at some of the preferences for this, it, this program includes tools for working with PNGs, JPEGs. Um, I think it'll also do GIFs, but uh, it doesn't do a whole lot with them. It uses a GIFsicle there. Um, and you can also control what kind of metadata it keeps and what it removes. Uh, color profiles are good if you think you're ever going to be editing this image again. If you're going to pull it into Photoshop, it, it definitely helps. But if you're just displaying it in a browser, most browsers ignore that information. You can, you can get rid of it. You can see here, actually, <laughs> that, that's why my image got rotated. I told it to take the rotation of information out. So this is a really useful tool, like I said, when you're putting a theme together, when you're putting a plug-in together, for making sure that the images that you ship with it are as small as possible. Another tool I like is CodeKit. Some of you might be familiar with this if you're a developer. It's a tool for, for the Macintosh. Oh, I should mention uh, Image Optim is available for uh, Macintosh, Windows, and, and Linux. It's an open source uh, tool that takes advantage of other open source tools to, to do its magic. CodeKit is only for the Macintosh. It's a paid program, but there are equivalents of it for Windows and Linux out there. But this is the one I like to use. It'll if you do any uh, SAS or LESS or Compass, it'll, it'll compile those for you into CSS. If you do uh, CoffeeScript, it'll convert that into JavaScript for you. Um, it handles HTML templating uh, libraries like Jade and Haml. And it handles image compression. And it does it fairly well. It's not quite as full featured as a tool like Image Optim. But, No, it does not want to shrink. <laughs> there we go. So you add the folder containing your project into CodeKit. And my apologies, the, the screen isn't wide enough to, to hold this whole window. But you can kind of see the user interface there. I'll scroll it back and forth as needed. Um, all you have to do is if you have an image in your project, you just go down to this optimize button down here, click optimize, it'll run through its magic, and it only saves 3%. But still, that's better than nothing. And if you're already using CodeKit in your workflow, then you've got this functionality pretty much for free. So it's, it's a great tool. If, if, like I said, if it's part of your workflow, you might as well use it. And then, um, actually, at the speaker dinner before WordCamp Providence, someone came up to me and said, hey, did you hear about JPEG Mini? JPEG Mini is an interesting one because it, um, it's written by some people who basically rewrote, they, they wrote their own JPEG encoder. They rewrote how a JPEG file is put together. And they managed to, they, they claim they can uh, make a file five times small, 20% the size of the original under ideal circumstances. And um, I've never been able to get quite that much compression, but it still does a great job. It has a really cool user interface. But uh, let's, let's take a photo here, back to my cats. And we'll drag my cats into there. Again, a 3.1 megabyte file. It's going to crunch through it. And it says it was able to save 1.97 megabytes out of that 3.1 megabyte file. That is pretty substantial. It says it reduced it by 2.8 times. That's very, very impressive with no real discernible difference in image quality. 
This is a tool available for $20 in the Mac App Store. I think it's worth every penny if you do a lot of JPEG images. That one is for Mac only, I believe. Now, after you've, you've got all these, these files and you put them in your theme or you put them in your plugin, right, you're going you're gonna to upload it all to your blog and you're going to want to start blogging, right? I mean, that's why we build these websites, right? Um, there are a couple WordPress plugins that I love to use uh, that basically handle all of this every time you upload an image file. You don't even have to think about it before you upload. Um, if you're familiar with WordPress, your theme might define a couple thumbnail sizes, right? And this will automatically, when WordPress is generating those thumbnails, it'll go and squeeze those image files too. So it's, it's a great way to, to make sure you're getting every byte possible out of those images. One that I love is EWWW Image Optimizer. I just call it EU. Some people don't like it because it does ship with some binaries for Windows and Linux, uh, the pre-compiled tools, kind of like ImageOptim uses. A lot of people don't like running you know, things like that on their server, and I can totally understand that. So use at your own risk. But the nice thing about uh, EWWW is again, because it ships with all of those tools, it can take care of crunching down those images right on your server. While you're loading that up, what is the risk that you're describing? The risk is, uh, let's see, there's a potential for security issues, basically. If nobody has gone through the, the code for these, these binaries, there is a possibility that they could ship with a virus. There is also a possibility that somebody could put a backdoor onto your website. The, the only defense I can offer for them doing this is, first of all, ease of use, and second of all, um, the fact that some, a virus scanner or something might have detected it already if, if there were something like that shipped in it. But again, it is, it is a very real risk. But just like, um, just like with the other tools, we can take our image and upload it right into the WordPress uploader. You're going to see it takes a couple seconds longer than the usual upload. And now if we look at our media library, we can see that this tool managed to take 8.3% off the size of that image. And again, it's not just optimizing that one image. It's optimizing it for any thumbnails that were created when this image was uploaded. And any time you make any edits to that image, it's going to do the same compression on it. None that I've noticed. They, they seem to do a really good job of, of not reducing the image quality. Yeah? Was it that plugin that unrotated your image, or was it like that when you uploaded it? It was like that when I uploaded it. The other question I have is, yeah. if I want to run this plugin on all the pictures I've already uploaded, can I do that under both the actions? Why, yes, you can. I totally didn't set them up for that. Bulk optimize. And it'll just run through everything. Now the security question is a very valid question. And again, you know, all I can say is this plugin is in the WordPress plugin repo. Um, we'd probably hear, hear some noise if there were a problem with the, the files that were distributed with it. But just in case, in, in case you are concerned about that, and rightfully so. There's another tool called WP Smush It. It's another WordPress plugin that uses a service called Smush It, smush.it, developed by some Yahoo engineers. They work for Yahoo, they're not Yahoo engineers. <laughs> but um, they, it, it basically does the exact same thing, except through a web interface, right? There, there's an actual smush.it website where you can upload an image and, and it'll create a, a compressed version of it. The only catch being there is a file size upload limit. And also, if you use the WordPress plugin, it tends to display some really weird error messages sometimes because the communication with the Smush It service isn't always up to speed. But if you are concerned about security, again, this is a very valid alternative. Um, it'll still give you really, really good results. 
And both of these plugins are available free in the WordPress, WordPress plugin repo at wordpress.org slash plugins. And I really recommend using one or, or the other. Yes? I haven't done anything with NextGen in a couple of years, but uh, I imagine it's going to start becoming a really popular feature. Again, as, as so much of the world is moving to mobile, <laughs> oh, there's my excuse to get a new one. Um, <laughs> as, as we're all moving toward mobile, I mean, we're going to we're going to have to to do something to make sure these images are, are crunched down. I've seen some pages that take 10, 15 seconds to load because people have you know 10,000 by 8,000 images on them. Especially in photo galleries, because people want really big, beautiful images, right? I want to talk briefly about scalable vector graphics. This is kind of the nerdy part of the talk. But uh, scalable vector graphics are, they're, they're an XML format. See, I've probably lost half, half the audience already. They're, they're an XML format that describes an image in terms of, of lines and circles and squares and triangles and colors and fills and, and strokes instead of just pixels. And the advantage of this is you get infinite resolution. As, as good a quality as your screen can handle drawing, that's how good the image is going to be. Um, here we're kind of limited by the resolution of the projector. But if we took this same SVG image and displayed it on a Retina iPad or a, a Chromebook Pixel or, or anything, I, I mean, you wouldn't be able to see any jagged lines in, in the curve of that G or anything. And again, because it is an XML, a text-based format, I mean, this, this, is an, this is a SVG graphic right here. It, it's small, it's human readable, and this, this little bit, five, five lines of code, gets you this red circle with a black line around it. And that's pretty impressive. Yeah. Uh, there are actually some good tools to, to draw these if you're not the programming type. Um, Adobe Illustrator can export to SVG, I believe. And I use a, an open source tool called Inkscape, which is it's a little harder to use, but uh, you can't beat the price. And then again, that's available for Mac, for Linux, and for Windows. That's Inkscape. And um, it's a really good way if you have an, an it's not going to work for a photograph, obviously. But if you have a, an illustration on your website, a nice uh, cartoon in your header, or I use uh, SVGs a lot for social media buttons, then this is a great way to save on space and take advantage of the, the really nice displays that we have on modern electronics. And you can see here there, there's some substantial savings by using SVGs. Um, a PNG file, uh, a, you know, a regular raster image of that red circle was three kilobytes. Doing it as an SVG was only 286 bytes. Yes? Okay. Yeah. Uh, will all browsers render an SVG? All modern browsers will. Um, I think IE6 might have a problem with this. Okay. Um, I, yeah, yeah. There, I think there's a polyfill that will render it to not canvas, but what's IE's equivalent of it? Yeah, they don't get the wrong thing. Yeah. Yeah, there are ways to get them to work in the older browsers, too. Um, I know that uh, recent versions of Chrome, uh, Firefox, and Safari have no problems with them, even going back a couple versions. So, yes? They can handle transparency just fine. Yeah, it's a great format, again, for, for illustrations, especially for small things like social media buttons that really don't need a huge graphic file to, to render a tiny little 30 pixel by 30 pixel graphic. Well, also like charts. Charts? Charts are a perfect example, especially if you're displaying them on a projector and you have a really good projector with, with really good detail. I mean, you can really make those things look good. But I'm going to do one better. There's an open source tool called SVGO, or SVGO. I'm not entirely sure how they want it to be pronounced. And um, it's an open source kind of command line tool for shrinking down SVG files. So 
Let's see, I am on, uh, I'm in my images directory already, so I'm going to SVGO-I for input file. We're going to tell it to use the red circle uh, SVG file, which was 286 bytes. And we're going to tell it to output to red circle 2. And drum roll please, 57 milliseconds. That's all the time it took. And it crunched that file by 48.3%. Okay, the resulting file was a hundred not even 145, 0.145 kilobytes. To put that into perspective, the, the PNG version was three kilobytes, the, the regular SVG version was 286 bytes, and the, the SVGO version was crunched down to 148 bytes. That is a huge savings over the, the PNG version. It's pulling out spaces. I think quotes might be optional in the, in the attributes. There's certain attributes on the SVG tag itself that the browsers don't really need to render it that are really there for Inkscape or uh, Illustrator's benefits. Yeah, it, they know all those rules and what they're able to take out of the file. And, and line endings, it takes out line endings because it's an XML file. Yeah, they've got a whole rule set that they run through. And uh, you still end up with a file that pretty much every browser is going to render. Um, I can't think of any exceptions. What about older versions of Internet Explorer? Um, you know, I haven't tested it, but I don't imagine there'd be a problem. Again, there, there might be that, um, what, what do they call it, viewport height, viewport width, that, um, that IE might have a problem with, but you'd have to check with the SVGO website, and they probably address that. Like, well, why would you do that when it's already going to come over compressed, right? It's already coming over the wire compressed. Um, well, first of all, it isn't always coming over the wire compressed because some people might not have their web server configured for that. But also, it's just a, it's an extra step. It, uh, it can get all the things that GZIP compression isn't going to get. I know, we're only talking 100 bytes or so. Well, I guess like, if you have GZIP compression turned on, you wouldn't, you wouldn't need to do that. I mean, it's probably a, an extra step in that case. Yeah. 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 Um, if you use Photoshop and you export the web, mm -hmm. um, how much of the savings do you get on these other tools, not counting the SVGs? Um, yeah, SVGs is different. Um, I never actually, I don't have a lot of experience with Photoshop. I did way, way back when. But um, from my experience, um, saving for web does a lot of these same compression techniques. Uh, you might get some better results with, uh, with something like image opt-in. Oh, I can speak to that a little bit. Yeah. If you do save for web with sort of a medium resolution, sometimes you'll see more of the image drop-off. What I like to do is save it out at high settings for save for web, make sure that I tell it not to export the metadata because there's a checkbox that says include metadata. If you're, d depending on what you're doing, you might want to keep that because that has things like copyright information might be in there depending on how you set up your images. But if you export um, at um, medium to high resolution from Photoshop and then run it through something like JPEG Mini, yeah. I found that it ends up being a smaller file than if I just scaled it down in Photoshop. Oh, okay. Yeah, there, there's a bunch of settings in here too that can affect, Again, it's a trade-off between how much time you want to spend watching that little spinny wheel go around and around and around versus the, the quality you want to get out of it. And I think Photoshop kind of optimizes for, for a balance there. But yeah, I think, uh, I think these tools are going to do a better job than Photoshop, but Photoshop's probably fairly adequate. You know, you're not going to save every, every byte that way. Yes? The GitHub tool for SVGO, um, mm. does it have to be done file by file? Yeah, it's to be done file by file, yeah. Yeah. Dave does a great job compression also. Oh, okay. I didn't know they built something like that into there. Yeah. Cool. So uh, for those who aren't familiar, GIMP is uh, an open source, I don't want to call it a Photoshop clone because it's kind of its own thing. They're, they're doing their own thing. User interface is a little different, but if you don't want to pay the, what is it, $800 for Photoshop now? You can buy it now. Yeah, you have to do the subscription thing. GIMP, the GNU Image Manipulation Program, I think it stands for, is, is a free open source tool. Again, Mac, Windows, Linux, a great tool for, for image editing.
And they have an export tool. Uh, and it kind of gives you the you know, choice of file format and then how much you want it. Mm -hmm. And you just play around with it. Yeah. Uh, another one I like to use on the Mac is Pixelmator. It's, I think, $30 or $40 these days. Again, so much cheaper than, than Photoshop. And, and with tools like this, you can get that same degree of compression actually even better than, than Photoshop offers. Maybe not as feature rich, but, but definitely much, much nicer on the pocketbook. Now, you showed us Image Optum, mm -hmm. and it reduced the file by 10%. Mm -hmm. And then you showed us JPEG Mini, and that I think did over 50%. Mm -hmm. Why would you use Image Optum? Image Optum can do PNGs and GIFs as well. So JPEG Mini just does JPEGs. It does one thing and it does it really, really well. Yeah. But uh, yeah, Image Optim covers all the major image formats. Ken? Uh, just two things to tack on. One, yeah. there's some tools that are available on websites, like I think it's PNG Mini or something. There, there's a couple of websites out there. Tiny PNG, I believe uh, it's called. There's a, for the JPEG, for the PNG, I think there's a couple different ones where you can actually pull up a website drag and drop your images and it'll crunch them down and let you download them again. So that's a little bit more of an irritating workflow because you have to upload and download and everything, but if you don't have the time to go out and install something on your computer, um, tools like this will let you get advantage of some of these things no matter where you are or how you're working. Um, a second quick addendum, I'm sorry for no, no. in, but uh, it was mentioned that SVG is an excellent format for charts because it's great at drawing like blocks of colors and gradients and lines and things. SVG is also recommended for charts over something like a PNG image or a static image because it's actually more accessible. Because it's just text, a screen reader, depending on how you create the SVG, a screen reader can get to that point and say, there's a chart here with a bar to 100 and a bar to 80 and a bar to 70. Whereas if a screen reader encountered a PNG, it would simply say, there's an image here. Um, there's a talk that I can post a link to on the uh, Meetup website that has some great tips about accessibility and SVGs. That would be awesome. I'm sorry? Can you, can you create uh, text in the chart? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. SVG can support text as well. Yes? You have the same uh, virus uh, threat with the image option as you do with the plugins? Um, no. I, I won't <laughs> say it's not a, not a possibility, but... Um, I, again, it's one of those instances where so many people use it and they're running it's, virus it's, scan it's, software. It's, 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 it's yeah, it's a pretty reliable tool. And the tools it's using are open source too, so there's people looking at the code to those tools too, the, the parts that make it up. Anyone else? Yeah. Um, you did talk about um, choosing initially whether or not it should be a JPEG or a PNG. Uh, I know it's a Beginner. Yeah, it is. I, I uh, basically um, JPEG for photographs of things, PNGs for screenshots. You know, JPEG is going to look at a, a twilight sky and say, well, so much of it is that same color of blue. I can really compress that down. PNG is is really going to look for the fine edges and the clouds, so to speak. And so, yeah. It, I, I don't know any hard and fast rules other than that. You know, photographs, definitely JPEG. Everything else, PNG. Transparency if you need alpha layer. If you need an alpha layer, then, then definitely PNG. And GIF if you're living in 1996. <laughs> no, not, not true. If you need animation, also. Oh, OK. Icon, uh, and actually, yeah, they'll yeah. be much smaller than ping or, because you would do an icon or something like yeah. that in ping, which is, if you need animation, you do that. Yeah, GIF has limits in terms of how many colors it can display at once. It really is a relic of, of its time. So you could run an animated GIF for this? Um, <laughs> I don't know if Gifsicle supports uh, animated GIFs. So that's a good question. But all the other compression ones do. I mean, you yeah. can press, you know. Um, oh, there's no settings for it. Yeah. <laughs> but no, I'm curious because, you know, especially on iOS devices, it doesn't display the animation until the whole thing is downloaded. And it drives me nuts. I see like one frame of the cat like this, one frame of the cat like this, five minutes later I'm looking at a cat jumping. You know, so That's if, iOS. if we could compress the I know. <laughs> no, it's actually the way the GIF is made. We have progressive GIF, right? Yeah. That would not be a problem. I guess the thing I'm going to say that I think, you know, is a, a, a benefit to it's 
it's about picking the right image for the right situation in the, in, in the day, right? It is true, there's no hard and fast route, but we know some of them, like, you know, photograph versus, mm -hmm. you know, uh, a chart or something. Um, also, <coughs> uh, WebP, you should talk about, um, that's an open source image format from Google that is supporting Chrome and, and other things. Mm -hmm. Much better than Ping, much better than JPEG as far as image compression. And you also need to talk about, um, you know, it's not just a simple matter of just you just compress one image anymore now. Mm -hmm. We've got retina screens we have to deal with, you know, yeah. uh, sending the right image to the right device, right? Mm -hmm. um, and doing the right thing so this, this stuff looks, you know, correct. Um, this came up at last month's meeting, too, about, you know, how do you deal with that? So, um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's definitely a concern. If you're doing a, a responsive website and you know that the screen is 300 pixels wide, there's, there's no point sending a, a 2,000 pixel wide image like that. You know, use, use your CSS to, to send a, a smaller image. And yeah, what was it? WebPE, I believe the, the Google format is? WebPE. Web, WebP, Web that's it. That's why PE is a Microsoft uh, executable format. Uh, WebP is, uh, I believe there's polyfills now to use it in Safari and other browsers. But it's a new format that Google <coughs> is starting to push because, like you said, it has better image compression than, than PNGs even. Um, it is still a new format, so you've got to worry about support in different browsers, but it is, it's starting to, to come into its own. But similarly, like, you would just send the right thing, right? So all the images on Facebook are WebP, right? Mm -hmm. um, whether you know it or not. So um, <laughs> if you have Chrome or Firefox, that's what you're going to get. Or if you have um, uh, an Android device, that's, yeah. that's what you're going to get. And they've, they've written an article about, you know, they say, you know, billions and billions of, you know, because it's so much, so much small at the at the scale that they're at, right? Yeah. But for people who can't render it, they just send them a JPEG, right? So it's yeah, we're we're starting to get into really developer oriented stuff there. But yeah, if you can look at the user agent string that the browser sends with every request, and you know this page is going to an Android phone or or a Chrome browser, then then definitely the, you can send this WebP format, and you're going to save you're going to save bandwidth. And uh, you're going to get that image downloaded much, much faster. But that's right. definitely something to think about, too, when you're building a theme. Do our program support creating those? Yes, okay. yes. They, well, it's, first of all, it's not that new, first of all. It's not yeah, that it's, new. It's, it's a couple of years so, old at this point. Any mainstream program that is out there today will support it. Yeah. Um, Photoshop, I'll put it in. Acorn, Pixelator, all these things. I'm, I'm sure GIMP does it, too. Yeah. 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 Any any other questions? Cool. Well, again, thank you so much. Thank you for coming out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.